over here. Do you have any questions on what's been going on? Okay, um, uh, so what I wanted to talk about today was uh, what, what uh, is known as quantum information theory. So, um, of course, a lot of what we've been doing has been studying quantum information, but in particular, this is the quantum version of the classical field of information theory, uh, which is concerned with quantifying information and uh, kind of sending it, sending it places. So, um, so let me start by giving, by talking about uh, the concept of entropy. Now, of course, you know entropy from thermodynamics, um, but entropy also has an information theoretic side. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about the connection between these two, uh, at least not today. It's possible but unlikely that I will do so tomorrow. Um, but uh, the... The, the formula is basically the same, and there is a kind of a deep physical reason for that. Um, but we're just going to focus on the information theory side of it. So, um, so the, uh, the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix rho is usually written S of rho, and it's minus trace, rho, log, rho. And inevitably, because we deal with qubits and other things like that, we're, we're working in base 2 for the log. Um, and uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, a measure of kind of the amount of randomness that's in a, in a density matrix. Um, and uh, it turns out it's a, a generalization of a, of a classical information theoretic concept called the uh, Shannon entropy. And so the Shannon entropy is the entropy of a probability distribution. So we have you know, some set of outcomes, and outcome i happens with probability p sub i. Um, and so then the the Shannon entropy of this probability distribution is uh, minus the sum over i of pi log pi. Okay, And you see that if, if rho is diagonal, which is a way of thinking of it as being basically classical, it's so that rho is a mixture right, of orthogonal outcomes, of basis states. Then its eigenvalues are pi's. And you know, trace of rho is 1, so the, the pi is sum to 1, which means they're really a probability distribution. Uh, it's you know, a positive semi-definite matrix, so all the pi's are greater than or equal to 0. Um, and uh, then this formula just becomes this formula. Right? So, so the, the Shannon entropy is a special case of the von Neumann entropy. Um, and uh, so the, the, the Shannon entropy, so, so how is this a measure of information? Well, if, if you're given a probability, I mean, if you're given a sample from a probability distribution, you know, so one event happens out of this set of possible events, um, how much information do you learn by, by seeing what event actually happened? Well, if the probab probability distribution is very, very highly peaked, Right? Maybe even in the extreme case, there's just one possible thing that could happen. Well, then actually looking to see what thing happened doesn't tell you anything, right? Because you already knew what was going to happen. Um, and on the other hand, if this probability distribution is very spread out, um, that you know, there's many possible things that could happen with reasonable probability, then actually finding out which one of those does happen is telling you a lot, right? It's, it's your... You're, you're learning something that you didn't know before. And so that's a sense in which this entropy is a measure of information. It's kind of telling you um, how much information was missing before that you now have once you see the outcome. OK? And the, the Shannon entropy, I mean, the von Neumann entropy can be viewed as a, as a measure of information in a similar way, although, of course, now it's a measure of quantum information. 
Um, okay, so so far so good. Okay, so uh, so let's write down some some properties of the entropy. Actually, let me do them over here. Okay, so. Um, The first property, well, what's the maximum value that S of rho can take? So if we have a Hilbert space of dimension D, so that would be log of D qubits. Um, well, what's the maximum value? The maximum value uh, happens when um, all the all the entries here are equal. All the probabilities or all the eigenvalues here are equal, and um, it's equal to log of d. So s of rho is less than or equal to log of d. Uh, and most of the time, I probably won't even bother writing this space two. And the maximum occurs. Or uh, rho equals i over d, so the maximally mixed state. Um, so property two. On the other hand, what's the minimum value it can take? Well, if we have a pure state, um, then well, okay. So I mean, I said that this is a generalization of this, but actually, if you if you diagonalize rho, you'll always get something of this form. Um, of course, rho might not be generated by a mixture of basis states. It might be you know, a mixture of non-orthogonal states or gotten by tracing over some entangled state, something like that. But anyway, so if you have a pure state, then there's one, one eigenvalue that's 1. And so you get uh, a 0 here, because 1 log 1. Um, and the other ones are all 0. And 0 log 0, well, at least in the limit, as you get to 0, that's 0. So, uh, so all of those get zero, and so for a pure state, the entropy is zero. Um, and uh, so, so the entropy is always between zero and log d. Um, and moreover, there's a lot of bounds we can set on. Uh, the, the entropies of regions. So, um, so suppose we have some composite system. So rho is the, the state of some whole, so the big system. And um, it's broken up into A and B. Okay? And then we're going to say that the, the density matrix of uh, rho on A is rho A, and rho on B is rho B. So rho A, of course, is the trace over B of rho, and rho B is the trace over A of rho. Okay? And frequently, when I'm talking about entropies and whatnot, I won't write S of rho A, I'll just write S of A. So, and so on. Um, so, so using that notation, um, we have something called the Iraqi Lieb inequality. Which you can also think of as a, a triangle inequality. And that says that if you have the entropy, so by this I mean uh, S of rho AB, or, or, or in that picture just S of rho. Um, this is uh, greater than or equal to the different, the absolute value of the difference, s of a minus s of b. Okay. Um, let's see. So, um, and then let me write out the next one and then talk about this one a little bit more. So we also have a property called subadditivity. And subadditivity says that uh, s of a b 
is less than or equal to s of a plus s of b. Okay, so, um, so this one is maybe a, a bit easier to understand, right? If we have you know, some, some uncertainty about what's going on in A and some uncertainty about what's going on in B, then when we combine them, the total amount of uncertainty we have is no more than the uncertainty of the parts. Okay. Now, um, in, in classical physics, uh, the entropy of AB, so A of, of AB, can't be any smaller than the entropy of just A. Okay? Because if there's some randomness going on in A, you can't get rid of it by adding in B. Right? It might not be any bigger if A and B are totally correlated, but it can't be any smaller. Now, in quantum mechanics, that's not true. Because um, in quantum mechanics, um, I mean, so, OK, it's easier just to think of the example, right? So what if we have a row as a pure state, right? And then we have um, uh, a part of that, but it's an entangled state between A and B. So part of that, A will be a, a mixed state, right? So there will be some randomness there, and the entropy will be non-zero. But then when we purify it by adding B, we get a zero entropy. Okay, so the, having the, the entanglement, the quantum correlations can actually decrease the entropy of the whole. And how much can it decrease by? Well, it can decrease by at most the entropy of B. Right? Um, and in fact, if you, um, yeah, why don't I switch these order? So if you, if you combine uh, property um, three and property two, then you can easily prove that uh, for a global pure state, of A and B, then um, S of A equals S of B. OK? Why is that? Well, um, we know that the global entropy is 0, because it's a pure state. And so uh, we have the entropy of A is S of A, and it has to somehow get shrunk down to, to zero. So that means that S of B has to be at least equal to S of A. But by the same token, if we just look at start at B, take the absolute value, so we're doing the opposite direction here, it can only get shrunk down, it has to get shrunk down to zero, so S of A has to be at least equal to S of B. And so they have to be equal. Okay? So that's another useful property of the entropy. Um, and then, so, so these, of course, are not enough to, to specify entropies. And there's, there's one additional property um, that, that people frequently use. And all of these are you know, not such a big deal to prove. This last one is kind of difficult. And it's a pretty uh, important property of quantum entropies. And it's called strong subadditivity. So strong subadditivity is something about uh, not two regions, but three regions. And um, it says that if you have the entropy of a region broken up into three parts, that it's less than or equal to S of AB plus S of BC minus S of B. Um, and so, so the picture that goes with this is Really, if you have a, a Venn diagram like this with intersecting regions, and then B is the intersection, A and C are here. Okay, so um, I mean, you, you can kind of understand this intuitively. That well, if you look at the the whole here, well, it could be S of AB plus S of BC, but then we've double counted the B region and we're subtracting that off. Um, and of course, because there can be correlations between these regions, the entropy could be less than that. But it turns out it can't be more. Um, now, the intuitive picture of saying, well, we have you know, some, some stuff over here and some stuff over here, and we're double counting B, is not right. Because, I mean, again, entropies reveal correlations of, of multiple regions. Like this can reveal correlations, and maybe there would be something weird going on that we don't expect. Um, but it turns out that, in fact, that is a property that's, that's correct for, these, for, this, for quantum systems. And it's just not that easy to prove. OK?
So any questions on entropy? The strong subjectivity implies subjectivity. Um, uh, uh, possibly. Let's see. If you take B empty, um, yeah, then it should be zero. Uh, so yes. Mm -hmm. What do you mean to assume? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, you, you have the definition. Oh, you, the subset of the previous property? Uh, no, it doesn't follow from the previous properties. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it follows from the definition of the entropy. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you just say, well, let S be some arbitrary function that has these properties, then no, it's, it's, you can't prove it. Um, so I should say that actually there's many different kinds of entropies. Um, don't know if I'll have time to talk about any others, but uh, there's, you know, there's Renyi entropies, which are kind of easier to calculate, but maybe a little bit less physically motivated. Um, there's uh, conditional entropies and relative entropies and all sorts of min entropies, max entropies, all sorts of things. And all of them have their uses. Um, this von Neumann entropy is kind of the central one. All the others are kind of built around it to some level. Um, and the, the von Neumann entropy is, is interesting for various operational reasons by itself, uh, some of which you'll see today. Um, but anyway, this is kind of the, the basic uh, properties, so if there's any more questions on this, now's a good time to ask them. Okay, so then let's move on. Um, so let's, let's talk about information theory now, and in particular, uh, one of the basic tasks in information theory is data compression. So now we're talking about classical information theory. And so again, we have a picture where Alice is trying to send information to Bob. Um, but in this case, there's no eavesdropper, there's no noise in the channel, nothing like that. Everything is perfect. Um, and Alice just wants to use the channel as efficiently as she can. Okay, so in particular, Alice has, um, has some, some set of possible messages that she wants to send to Bob. And she wants to use as few bits as possible to send those messages. Okay, um, so for a concrete example of this, let's, uh, let's suppose Alice has... Um, Yeah, let's start a new column. Alice has four possible messages. So she has uh, A, which occurs with probability uh, one half. She wants to send B with. Uh, Probability one quarter. Um, she wants to send C with probability one eighth. And she wants to send D with probability one eighth. Okay. Now, if she just did kind of the straightforward, most obvious possible encoding she could do, she'd say, well, there's four possible messages I can have. So I would need two bits to encode that. Right, and uh, you know, zero zero would be A, zero one would be B, one zero would be C, one one would be D. Okay, so two bits. Okay, but she can look at this this pattern of messages, and Alice and Bob maybe they know ahead of time. Uh, what the what the the probability of each each message is is going to be, and she can say, well, you know, the message A is much more likely than the other messages. The message is C and D; they're not very likely. Um, so, what if uh, I I use a very short message to 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 indicate that it's A, right? Because that comes up most often, 
um, and then longer ones for the other messages. So for instance, I can say I'm going to encode A as just 0. Okay, if you get a 0, you know that it's an A. Um, and then B, well, B has to be something that's different. I don't want to start it with 0, because then you'll think it might be an A. So let's start it with 1. Um, but I don't want to stop there, because uh, then I won't have anything for C and D. So B will be 1, 0. Okay. Um, and then C and D, well, I should start them with 1, 1. So you won't get them confused with A or B. But then I need something to distinguish them, so let's add a third bit. And C will be 0, 0, 1. D will be 1, 1, 1. OK? So, so now, how many, how many bits um, are this gonna, is this going to use with compression? Oh, yes, next bit. Right. So, it's, so, it's gonna, so that's, that's an interesting thing. It's not going to be always the same number of bits. It's going to depend on which message I have. So, um, so the question is, how many bits will it take on average? Uh, so on average, well, I have a probability of one half of using one bit and one quarter of using two bits, and then, well, one eighth plus one eighth, so it's another one quarter of using three bits. Right? Um, and so what does that add up to? Well, this is five quarters, and this is two quarters, so this is seven quarters. So I, I've saved one quarter of a bit on average by using this compression scheme. Okay? And um, you know, if I only do this once, then maybe I'll get lucky and, and I've saved one bit. Um, but on the other hand, I might get unlucky and actually have to spend one extra bit. So if you're just doing it once, it's not clear if this is something you really want to do. But suppose you're doing this 10,000 times. Alice is sending lots of messages, and each one of them is generated according to this probability. Then um, you're saving you know, a quarter of a bit for each of those 10,000 messages, which adds up to be quite a lot, you know, 2,500 bits. OK? So that's, that's where compression comes in. Um, and, and this is actually a relatively small amount of compression, right? You can imagine a much larger amount of compression. So for instance, suppose we have um, a, a string of bits that's 99% uh, know, of the time it's 0, and 1% of the time it's 1. Okay? And it's a very, very long string of bits like this. So um, you know, if you're sending one bit for each of these, these things, Suppose, again, you're sending 10,000 of them. Um, then, then you have to send 10,000 bits. But, but because only 1% of them are 1, you're actually much better off um, saying where the 1s are rather than for each 1 saying this is a 1 or a 0. Right? And so say, oh, the first 1 occurs at, at you know, spot number 50. Okay? And so that uses you know, log 50 bits to say that. And the second 1 occurs at spot number 123. Okay, and so that's you know, an, another small number of bits to say that. Um, and and uh, by and large, you'll save quite a lot by doing that. Okay. You'll go down to, I don't know, roughly, roughly log 100. For 100, sorry, roughly log 100 per, per message. Log of 1 over 100. Sorry, that's not right either. That's a negative number. Anyway, it's the formula. It's the formula up there, as you'll see in a moment. OK. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so in general, what we can do is we can say, OK, so let's imagine we're in this situation where we're sending lots of messages. Um, Sending lots of messages, and uh, um, we want to we want to see how many bits we can save by doing compression. Well, what we can do is we can say, well, um, so we have we have uh, probability uh, pi of message i. 
So out of uh, n total messages, well, with very high probability, there will be roughly pi times n i messages. OK? And you can run through all the i, and that's still going to be true. It won't be exactly pin messages, but it'll be, with very high probability, it'll be close. OK? The, the probability distribution gets very highly peaked around one particular distribution of the number of messages. OK? Um, so the, the upshot is that if you look at the, the possible strings of messages, some of them are very unlikely. Right? For instance, getting message one every time. Some of them, well, no, in, no individual string of message is, is likely. But if you kind of sum up all the message strings that have roughly PIN type I messages, then collectively that's very likely. Okay? So this is what's called a typical set of of messages. And a typical set is basically defined as being some, some set of, of uh, message strings that has total probability that's very close to 1. Okay. Now, obviously, you're, what you're interested in is a, a relatively small set of typical messages. And then our compression scheme, known as, known as a block compression scheme, is we're going to, to list the typical messages and uh, assign bit strings to them. Okay? So I'll just you know, write down in whatever order I like all of the, the messages in my typical set. So all of the messages that have you know, roughly pi times n uh, things of type i. Um, and uh, I'll count them. And you know, the first one, will, I'll send that as 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Second one is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Then 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. Okay? And uh, therefore, the total number, and then, and then anything that's not typical, I'll, I'll ignore them. Okay. Or alternatively, you can use you know, some extra bits, sort of like in that case, um, to, to, to have a less efficient way of describing the atypical messages. But let's, for the moment, say I'll ignore them. And then, then Bob, on the other side, he gets this uh, compressed version. And um, he'll take the bit string that he receives and go back to this lookup table and figure out which typical message it corresponded to. Okay. Now, if it was an atypical message that Alice was trying to send, then Bob lookup doesn't mean anything because Alice just put in something at random or, or maybe she put in a message that said, sorry, it doesn't work. I got an atypical message. Um, but the probability of that is very small. Okay. So almost all the time, Bob will, in fact, be receiving a typical message, and he'll decode it correctly. OK? Yeah? The idea here is that like, you're sending enough information that it's sort of like you know, Bob, you kind of you know, you have to throw some data in the lookup table. Well, yeah, so the, the lookup table, yeah, OK. So the lookup table is uh, the protocol, right. OK? Um, and so that's not counted as information that has to be transmitted. That's something that you've kind of arranged ahead of time. Now, in practice, you don't really want a big lookup table. You want some, some algorithm that lets you say, oh, given this sequence of messages, I can convert it to a, a string that I can send. Okay. But that's, um, yeah, that's kind of a little bit beyond the scope of what I wanted to do. Yeah? So you are, if you have a long message, you are going to like break it into that's right. So, 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 in a block compression scheme, that's what you do. Okay. Um, 
Now, there's other kinds of compression schemes that don't really work that way. And in fact, this one that I was showing you up there, we have this variable length encoding, already doesn't kind of work that way. There's a, in that case, there's a specific encoding um, for each message, for each, you know, each individual thing that gets sent. Um, and then I can just kind of tack on as many as I like. And it will work out in, in more or less the same way. Whereas here, it's like if you're sending a book, you're, at least 400 characters, you know, are a typical message because they're like 5 to 10 to use these like 10 after the instruction. Right. If something is like 37% dead, then we can just encode for that. Uh, in, you're right, in this case. Okay. Yeah. Whereas in the, in the previous case, there is a code for it. Um, it's just it'll be much longer. Uh, I mean, the other advantage of the things up there is that um, is that so? So in this case, you have to you have to look at you know whatever your chunk size is, ten pages, and you have to count all the letters in them and you know figure out what the encoding is. Um, in the in the in the code up there, you can look at each letter one by one and send it. So that has a lot of advantages. This is just conceptually easier to explain how it works. Okay, there was some other question up here somewhere. Okay. Can both of these be combined? So like you're assuming that uh, each typical message is equally likely, right? Or like we're giving uh, it yeah. Time. So right. So I'm assuming that, but it's okay. So the there is a model. There is a model underlying this, um, which I, I suppose I could write down somewhere. So, um, so the assumption is that each message is uh, um, is is drawn from the same probability distribution. Um, and is independent. So what, I'm, what, what that means is that the probability of getting you know, message B for the second message is, is, is always a quarter, no matter what the previous one was. Um, and uh, that you know, if I look at the, the 10th message and the 233rd message, they all use that same probability distribution, or this more general one. Um, and so this is known as an IID source. IID for uh, independent, identically distributed. Um, and so, so, so given that assumption, it's actually a statement. I mean, it's a mathematical statement that all of the typical messages have the same probability, roughly. Okay? Um, and, and you can calculate it. Uh, which I'm, I'm not actually going to do, but um, oh yeah, I will. Okay, so I mean it's 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 a trivial calculation. So what's the what's the probability of getting uh, n i messages of type i? Um, sorry, that's not what I want. So I want I want the probability of some particular string of messages that happens to have ni messages of type i running over all i. Mm -hmm. So what's the probability of that? Well, the first message is you know, type, type 1, and so that is probability p1 of happening for the first message. The second one is type 2 and has probability p2. And the third one, maybe that's type 1 again, that had probability happening of p1. Okay? And so the probability of getting all of this is the product of all of these things. And I'm going to have how many pi's I'm going to have? I'm going to have ni of them. Right, so the total probability here is the product over i of pi to the ni. Okay, and so when ni is exactly equal to, to n times pi for, for all i, this probability is always the same, okay, regardless of the order. Um, and that just comes out of the iid source. It had to be symmetric under the order. Now, when it's slightly off, then uh, that's not true anymore. Um, and so then the probability is, is in, indeed slightly different. And it's true I'm not taking advantage of that. Uh, but it, it turns out that there's not much you can be gained by taking advantage of that. Um, maybe some kind of subleading stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so, um, 
So the other thing that's, that's interesting is the question of how many messages there are in this typical set. And actually, that's very interesting, because that's going to tell us how many bit strings we need to describe them all. Well, uh, you can figure that out. So, I mean, so if we're looking for exactly the exactly typical messages, the ones that have exactly uh, ni equals, equals pin, um, well, there's uh, uh, quite a lot of them. Um, but it turns out, if you, if you calculate that, um, that, that it's uh, basically 2 to the n h of pi. Um, plus, uh, you know, some, some little o of n. So little o is like big O, except it's strictly uh, less than for all constants. So it's a kind of subleading term. Um, and you can calculate this just by, by writing down numbers. Let's see. Um, so how many typical ones? So there's... Uh, yeah, so, okay, so actually, so the cutoff for this, it, you have the cutoff that, that, um, that this difference here is little o of n. Okay, so, so this is how close I want it to be to typical. I mean, for, for some, some particular choice here, usually it's going to be 1 over square root of n, because that's what you get from kind of the, the random width. Sorry, not 1 over square root of, square root of n. Sorry, so, so pin here is the probability, is basically the number of messages with type i. That we expect to see. Expect to see. Right. And so, the, so, so I'm going to, my typical messages will be ones that are close to that, that have close to the, the expected number. So they'll actually have ni of t things of, of message i. And, and, how close should it be? Well, we expect just from you know random statistics that it should be about square root n away. So you're talking about like the, the kind of global. The global distribution, yeah. For this, this is a block compression scheme. So we're looking at a block of many messages. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, so you can, you can work out the exact number of messages of exactly this size, and then you take the limit as n goes to, to, to infinity, um, and use Sterling's approximation, and you get basically this. Uh, for whatever reason, I decided not to write that down on my notes, so I won't try to reproduce it right now. But, um, but, but uh, the upshot is that... Um, is that we need uh, uh, n h of pi plus little o of n bits to send this. And in particular, um, when h of, h of pi is less than its maximal value, we're saving over just sending the... So, okay. So, I mean... If the maximum value of h of pi, just like the maximum value of s of rho, is log of the total number of possibilities. Okay? And that's the number of bits we'd need if we were not compressing. We'd need n times log of the total number of possibilities for each message. Okay? And then when h of pi is less than that, we're saving. And that's what the compression is getting us. Okay? And so this, this fact is incorporated in kind of one of the main theories of main theorems of information theory, which is Shannon's uh, source coding theorem. theorem. 
And it says, um, so uh, it, says, it says two things. So it says, first of all, it says this thing, that this is sufficient. So to compress n um, messages from an IID source with entropy H. And uh, we want the, the asymptotic failure rate to go to 0 as n goes to infinity. So that's what I said before, that the atypical message has become very unlikely. Um, So we need at least this number of bits. And there exist coding schemes. There exist compression schemes. using only that number of bits. OK? So, so this is telling us basically what the, the asymptotic requirement is, sufficient and necessary, for uh, compression of, inf of information, from, at least from an IID source. Um, and so this is one of the operational interpretations of the entropy. And you can see why it now has the meaning of information, right? Which is, in order to actually send information in the usual sense, this is really how many bits we need. And so that's telling you how much information in a, in a practical sense, how many transmissions you need to kind of incorporate everything about the, the, the source. So um, since the example of language came up in, in one of the discussions, let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so, so, so certainly in the, in, in the English language, some letters are much more common than others, right? E is very common. Q is not so common, unless you're doing quantum information, because <laughs> everything has a Q. But um, so, so if you calculate the entropy, um, you'll definitely get something less than log of 26. Of, of English language. Uh, but, but the other thing about, the, about language is that it's not an IID source. right? If uh, you do happen to see a Q, it's pretty likely that the next letter is going to be a U. Right? So they're not independent. Um, and you know, if you see a couple of consonants in a row, it's getting pretty likely that you're, you're going to see a vowel soon. Um, so, uh, so in order to do better, in this compression scheme, you can, I mean, you can do better than just taking the probability of each letter and treating it. You can look at the probability of words. Right? And you say, well, some words are more likely than others. Um, but even, even beyond that, you know, sequences of words. Some sequences are more likely than others. Even given that all the words are in, the, in them are, are likely words, for instance, it's still unlikely to see uh, you know, the sequence cow house. Right, they're pretty common words, but together they, you don't say that very often. Um, so, 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 so real life compression schemes try to take advantage of this kind of thing and the correlations in the language. Um, and and uh, I mean, I said that one of the reasons that we have you know, high speed communications is because of good error correction. But the other reason is because of good compression schemes. And certainly, you'll see compression schemes kind of ubiquitously. I mean, pretty much every format, file format that you use nowadays for sending anything, PDF, uh, JPEG, they're all compressed. Okay? And the better ones transmit faster. That, that's sometimes even obvious. Um, OK.
So any more questions about classical compression? Yeah. So in natural language, when you say so not I agree, does that mean that there's some, does that make it easier or harder to compress it? Like if we, uh, um, well, OK. So, uh, so I think, by and large, you can do a, a pretty good job of compressing if you just do treat the, the letters or the words in an IID way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in principle, it could be that the correlations, let me think. Yeah, OK. And actually, I can even prove that to you. Um, so suppose I, I look at compressing the words rather than compressing individual, le individual letters. Or let's, let's simplify some more. I'm going to block off the words into groups of five and treat them as you know five letters in a row as one of my messages as opposed to treating the individual letters as a message. So how much, how much compression is that going to take? Is it going to take more or less? Um, well, by this property of subadditivity, I know that the entropy of a five-letter block is going to be less than or equal to the sum of the entropies of the one-letter blocks. Okay? So compressing as a group of five cannot take more. It can take less because there's correlations, and it will take less. But it can't take more, OK? Um, but, um, and, and so certainly you can, you can do much better that way. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any idea what the actual numbers are. Um, but uh, you can improve already by compressing at the level of single letters. And if you just kind of ignore the additional correlations, it doesn't hurt you, except giving up something, an, a further improvement that you could make, OK? Sure. Like, so that, like, what's the, when, when can I, what, how can I, like, definitively cut my setting to be? Ah, good question. You, you can't. You can't. Um, it's, not, it's not kind of an invariant property of the set of messages. Generally, what it is is a property of the compression scheme. Okay? So the compression scheme is kind of saying, this is a set of typical messages, okay. um, meaning that the total probability of the set of messages is exponentially close to 1 as uh, n gets large. OK? Um, and you know, if different compression schemes have different typical sets of messages, that's generally OK. But what we do know is because the total probability of a typical set has to be close to 1, that if you take the typical set for one compression scheme and the typical set for another compression scheme, they're going to have a very large intersection. In fact, uh, the, the, the difference between them itself has to be an atypical set, meaning that the probability is, goes to zero as n gets large. When you say the probability goes to zero, like the probability of, you know, I want to talk about n, and it's a number of messages of n. Right? Yeah, so compression scheme, um, I mean, it's easier to talk about them as uh, actually kind of a sequence of protocols for larger and larger n. I mean, in this, like in this theorem, there's an explicit limit that I'm, I'm imagining. Mm -hmm. okay? So I have some sequence of protocols for larger and larger n. And so this typical set is not just for a single value of n. It's a sequence of sets for larger and larger n. So you're saying that like, I have a sequence of kind of, I have a, a, I have a compression of the block of messages as I OK? Um, yeah, so I mean, to, to kind of make everything precise and to prove this theorem, you have to go through and put in epsilons and deltas of, you know, well, how, how high really do I mean by high probability? Um, I want the failure rate to go to 0. How fast could it go to 0? Things like that. Um, and that can be done. It's just I didn't want to bother with it uh, because we don't have much time to talk about this stuff in the class. Are there other questions about classical compression? OK, so then let's move on to quantum compression.
so we have kind of a similar setup. We're going to have some, some IID uh, quantum source. And with probability PI, it gives Alice, uh, Alice gets the state psi i. And I should say that Alice doesn't know exactly what state she's getting. It doesn't tell her, oh, you're getting psi i. Um, it's give, it just gives it to her. Uh, otherwise, you'd kind of be getting a classical message, right? Um, and so her goal is then, of course, to send this to Bob, or given you know, some set of n of them, to send them all to Bob. Um, and so we can describe this source with a density matrix. Right? The state that, that Alice is getting uh, is a mixed state, right? It's probability pi of psi i. So, so what she's getting is the density matrix sum over i pi psi i psi i. Yeah? Uh, identical. identical. So every time she's getting a state, it's drawn from the same distribution. Um, OK, so, uh, right. So, um, so then she wants to send these to Bob. Um, and kind of, we want a similar statement that uh, it should work almost all the time. Um, but since, well, we have various notions of distance in the quantum case. Uh, so it's, it's, in fact, good enough. Um, so in this case, we were kind of imagining um, that uh, either Bob would get exactly the right string, or with a very small probability, he might get something else. Okay? But in the quantum case, we can imagine uh, as getting, Bob getting a state that is very close to the, to the correct state um, in the sense that it has high fidelity to the correct state. Um, but now we have to be maybe a little bit careful about what we mean, because uh, we're getting mixed states. I mean, we could say, well, the density matrix should have high fidelity. But, but suppose these states are being given to Alice by somebody who does know what they are. Right? Then even if the density matrix is right, uh, we might be concerned that the you know, the exact pure state, which is known to this other person, is getting messed up. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, the most straightforward way is to say um, there's some reference system which kind of keeps track of what state is being given to Alice. OK? And um, then Alice transmit to Bob, and we want Bob in the reference system, the state of Bob in the reference system, to be close to the correct state. So in particular, what we're going to do here is we're going to give Alice and Bob a pure state, which is the purification of rho. So rho is equal to the trace over r of psi. OK. And, and, and why does this? Good, why is this good enough to incorporate all of these models? Well, uh, I don't know if you learned this in, when you were talking about purifications in previous classes, but, but um, when you have a purification like this, there's always some, for any given uh, mixed state, or sorry, mixed decomposition of rho like this, there's always some measurement that you can make on the R system that will produce this distribution on Alice's system. OK? So for instance, um, well, OK, yeah, it's, it's maybe, it, OK. So I mean, so for instance, if you have a maximally entangled state here, right, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, on the reference system, you can measure in the, um, in the z basis, and you'll get probably a half of 0 for Alice and a probability half of 1 for Alice. So that's an example of the sort of thing. But if you make a different measurement, then you'll get different pure states for Alice. Okay. And, and by making any measurement you like, you can get um, 
you, you run over all the possible decompositions of rho into mixtures like that. So I'm, I'm seeing by your faces that this is new information for you. OK, but it's a good thing to know. Okay. So um, the, uh, the upshot is that uh, this picture here incorporates all the possible uh, distributions that Alice could get that have the density matrix rho. And so it's good enough to make this work, and then all of those other possibilities work as well. Okay? So, so our goal here is to preserve the fidelity with the, with the, of the full state with the reference system. So that's called the entanglement fidelity. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, entanglement swapping is basically using teleportation on half of an entangled state. Um, this argument, um, I mean, it has more to do with a tutorial problem. Oh, sorry, that's not a tutorial problem. Well, it'll be one of your homework problems, I believe. Um, so there's a, there's a relationship between uh, kind of an entanglement-based uh, quantum key distribution system and the BB84 system that I talked about yesterday. And I don't remember exactly what we put in the problem, but it's related to, to this question. Um, right, so high entanglement fidelity. So, which is saying that the, the state uh, RB should be very close to the state RA, which is just this big psi. Um, but, but uh, OK, so but of course, we don't want it to be true necessarily for each individual. I mean, we want it to be true for the whole thing. Not, so this is the, the output state. Uh, so the output state, of course, doesn't have to be an actual tensor product. The input state is by assumption. right? That's what it means to say it's an IID source in, in, for the quantum case. Uh, okay. So when you say close, do you mean like very close to the um, uh, Well, in this case, I'm saying high fidelity, but that also means the trace distance is small. And yeah. These sides are in general different to each end, right? Or like each side. Uh, is one method. No, no. Yeah. So sorry. So this is. So this is. This is. I'm, I'm assuming an IID source. Mm -hmm. So every time Alice gets a message, it's drawn from the same probability distribution. And so we have the same purification row. I mean, so we have the same density oh, okay. matrix row and the same purification the same psi. So it's always the same psi okay. Okay. because it's an IID source. Mm -hmm. And when we do it n times, actually we have psi tensor n. Okay. That's, that's what I was writing up here. Right. Okay. And, and then um, Alice will do some compression scheme, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then Bob gets some output. And then I want the collective output of Bob and the whole reference system for all of these n iterations to be close to this tensor product input state. Right, the output state, again, because the, the compression might involve some interaction between the different copies, doesn't have to be a tensor product anymore. Uh, and in general, I don't think it will be. But, uh, but it's nevertheless close to one. Yeah? So you're going to be definition of Oh. Uh, yeah, so for mixed states, it's, um, it's this little complicated thing. And let me look it up so I don't get it wrong. Uh, so fidelity of rho and sigma is um, trace of square root rho to the 1 half sigma rho to the 1 half. This, of course, is a fidelity between a pure state and a mixed state, which is a bit easier. It's just the, uh, the it's just this. Or maybe absolute value of that. Uh, 
Uh, yes, square root. square root. Okay. So other questions on what we're trying to do here or what the, the definition is? Okay, so, so how do we do it? Um, uh, so that uses something called Schumacher compression. And uh, the, the strategy is actually basically the same as what we did classically. So what we're going to do is we're going to diagonalize rho. And um, then run a classical compression scheme in the eigenbasis of rho. Okay, um, and uh, you want to do it coherently, obviously, so you don't destroy superpositions. Uh, you need to run it a reversible version of this classical computation, and of course, you want to erase all the intermediate stuff. So again, not to destroy entanglement. Um, but when you do that, um, uh, then at the end, well, so whenever Alice is sending, I mean, so you can imagine measuring this reference system so that Alice is sending basis states because that's a possible decomposition. And then Bob is getting basically the same basis state with very high probability by the classical compression properties. Um, and uh, so the upshot is that, at least for that basis, it's very similar to the, to the original thing. Um, and, but it turns out that, in fact, you're, you're even preserving entanglement and all that other stuff with whatever is going on. So it does, when you do this, it does, in fact, have high entanglement fidelity. And this um, uses how many bits? It uses uh, n s of rho plus little o of n qubits. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, she's, she's, so in this case, we're doing block coding. So she's taking a whole n of these messages. She's uh, doing some, well, it's not unitary because it's going to a smaller space, but she's doing some unitary transformation involving ancillas that go to some smaller Hilbert space, tensor some junk that she keeps that basically contains you know, information about the atypical stuff. Um, and then she sends a smaller Hilbert space to Bob, who then does the inverse and gets back something close to the original. That's right. Yeah, so again, if, if Alice wanted to send this without compression, um, well, uh, we have a d-dimensional Hilbert space for rho. And so she'd have to send log d qubits to, for, for each message. So we'd have n log d, which is the maximum value of s of rho. And so when S of rho is below its maximum value, we're saving. OK? Um, so maybe then uh, to finish off, I will just comment that so this compression scheme, as I've described it, assumes that Alice and Bob know what rho is. right? And so they know what basis to work in. And uh, they know what the kind of the probabilities of the basis states are and so on. Um, so they can they can they can work out the typical sets, um, but it, that's even that is actually not necessary. There's something called universal compression, classically or quantumly. In the quantum case, what you have to do is you have to say, well, okay, we're going to use we're going to get many many sim symbols eventually, right? Many many messages. Um, so for the first number of times, Alice is not going to try to be very efficient in compressing, um, but what she's going to do is she's going to make some kind of weak measurement on each one to try to gain some information about what rho is. Okay? And then eventually, she'll have a pretty good idea of what rho is. And so she'll know what compression scheme to use. She'll send a description of that to Bob. And then from then on, she'll use that good compression scheme. Okay? Um, now, again, there's a bunch of epsilons and deltas you have to look at to make, to make this work right. 
Uh, but the point is that the description of rho and the description of the compression scheme, they're, well, not exactly constant size because you want you know, the, the accuracy to get better and better as the system gets bigger, but, but pretty close to constant size. And so as you're sending many, 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 many messages, that initial phase is kind of negligible in size. And so that's why this universal compression works. Uh, so let me stop there. Are there questions? Source has a density matrix, but ultimately what we're trying to send like a string of qubits, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, you mean the physical thing that gets sent over the channel, or the messages, the, 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 message, the underlying message of what you want to send? The isn't the density matrix, right? It's the actual string of qubits. That's right. Data. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, so, I, yeah, sort of. I mean, so. I, th I think it's important to be able to separate between kind of the physical realization of the message mm -hmm. and the underlying uh, state of the message. It's the state that she wants to send. Well, um, so, so, so for instance, in quantum teleportation, mm -hmm. right? I say, well, you get out the same qubit at the end. Mm -hmm. But obviously, it's physically a different qubit, right? It could be in a totally different system, right? So if you, if you have an entangled state between... Um, I don't know, a photon and an atom, mm -hmm. and then you teleport through this entangled state, the state, of, and you get, you, your input state is a photon. You do some, somehow you get an me entangled measurement between the two photons, mm -hmm. and you teleport, and at the other end, now your state is in the atom. Right. Okay? So it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mapping of the states of one Hilbert space to another Hilbert space, mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing that we're trying to and we're kind of kind of modding out by that and trying to preserve the underlying state given this kind of equivalence that we've put in between the different Hilbert spaces. And, and we're doing that by going through, in the case of compression, by going through a medium of smaller dimension. Right. So I'm trying, just trying to find the analogy between this and classical compression because sure. the density matrix tells me the probability. The density matrix is more like the probability. Matrix That's right, yeah. Right, that's right. right. But so this is why this is why I want to have the purification, mm -hmm. um, because so in the classical, I mean, if you think of this purification in the classical case, well, there is no purification in the classical case, of course. Right. But the closest analog would be to say, oh, there's a a, a referee here mm -hmm. who knows what the messages are that Alice is getting, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, Bob is going to be able to tell whether he got the right thing by comparing with the referee. And so we want the state of the referee and Bob to be close mm -hmm. to what the referee and Alice had initially, right. which in that case was totally correlated. Right. Um, so that's, I, I, is that? The, different, the big difference is that there, the message is just whatever Alice wants to send, whereas here, Alice doesn't actually know the message. That's right, yeah. Okay. So right. it's uh, like the way you've kind of written that setup, the idea is that the referee has, the, I mean, Alice is kind of the group of Alice and the referee. You might have the density matrix uh, kind of the... Well, sort of. Uh, the, the thing is that Alice doesn't have access to whatever the referee has. Right. So her, her compression is done completely on this state, on the density matrix state. Right. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, I guess, I guess at the end of the day, you know, we kind of think about this, this um, global size or the, this global size containing all possible combinations of density matrices and it's splitting up into... Um, you know, R and A, where R contains information about the density matrix, which, which, which of the eigenvalues or eigenvalues of the density matrix are sending. But really, you could just do it the other way around, that R could send that combination of the density matrices kind of past its true size. And from the perspective of that, you know, like it's not uh, in terms of sorry, the mechanics, I mean, like in terms of the, 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 the idea of what's going on here is, you know, R sets up just this density matrix that corresponds to whatever that, you know, whatever it's measured and sends that to Alice and Alice doesn't know this hasn't come from the, the global side. Um, that's right. And in fact, and in fact, uh, because of this property that I said that R can make, you know, different kinds of measurements and prepare different ensembles for Alice. Um, so that's called steering, by the way. Um, R, R can just start out with the state psi and then decide later, you know, long after all this has happened, 
which ensemble he actually wanted to send. Yeah. Uh, so that's a. Uh, so I was unable to like influence the what he what he received, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, so the density matrix that V receives is always going to be the same. Right. Um, but from R's point of view, he can say, well, actually, that density matrix was a mixture of these things. You can choose which base. And then he, can, he, has some, he gets to, to even see which thing in the mixture it was. Um, it's just that experimentally, there's no way that Bob by himself could ever tell, or Alice for that matter. Um, yeah, so uh, tutorial today, and then tomorrow's last lecture, we'll talk about, I guess, uh, channel capacity with, with noisy channels, which obviously we've talked a, a bunch about in terms of error correction, but I want to talk from the information theory point of view, and about entanglement, quantifying entanglement. Okay.